I want to bring in my guest for this hour, hour criminal defense attorney, Silva Megodician. Silva, good to see you again. Good to see you, Michael. A pleasure. All right. Now, the last time I think we were together on my show, we were talking about Prokopovitz. And that particular case, this case reminds me a little bit of that case in, in a sense that you have someone leading a secret kind of life, and he's got this thing going on with this person. And I think at the end of the day, it's a circumstantial case that this jury is going to reach a verdict by saying, what else could have happened here? Now, we didn't think, I think both of us thought that maybe there wasn't enough for a conviction in that case. Love to get your take on this case. You're so right, Michael. I was <laughs> going to bring that up, too. I mean, I was so convinced that jury would find him not guilty. And you should have seen my face. I actually watched court TV coverage on it. And literally waiting for my client, I was like, oh, my God, it's a guilty. How? I think this case is a lot stronger. I feel like exactly what you said. There, there is at least circumstantial evidence here. The prosecution did a great job telling a very compelling story of it, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's likely a duck. I mean, the fact of the matter is I, I really liked what she said when she said two worlds, his secret life and his real life were about to collide. Very powerful opening statement. And there is more for the prosecution to bite on in this case. So it's going to be very interesting to see what the defense will counter with. Yeah, you know, you really, as a defense attorney, in this type of case, you've got a, a defendant who's not particularly um, sympathetic, and you have an extremely sympathetic uh, victim, very similar to Prokopovitz, and it is a circumstantial case, but in this particular case, I think the pieces fit together, as you said, so much better, that when they pile up, and when this jury deliberates on the circumstantial evidence that we're hearing will be presented, what has been presented so far, it's going to be tough to walk away and say that he's not guilty of this crime. Exactly. And as a defense attorney, too, I, you know, the defense did a good job humanizing Addie and trying to explain, look, he was so happy. He was with the woman that he loved. He was getting ready for this marriage. The problem is, if not him, then who? And just as you were explaining to Janae, the, the, the tire track issue is really difficult to get away from. And the defense is going to have to bring an expert to counter that evidence because that is something very direct that the jury can chew on. And you don't want that kind of evidence in the jury room taking over. All right. So we know what they do have, but here's what they don't have. They have no DNA. Right? We know that juries in these days, DNA is important. They have no footprints. They have a tire print. They have dragging marks of the body, but no footprints. So that's interesting. Um, they um, have no gun, no casings. And really, you talked about motive, but I guess, I guess you can buy the motive that he was getting closer to the date. But he was, he was putting money down. He was going in for licenses all up until a couple of days before. So I don't know if that motive holds up. So there's a lot that the prosecution doesn't have. Exactly. And I think the defense said it best. The defense stated very clearly that the prosecution was trying to jump to conclusions. But what juries like, from my experience with jury trials, they want to hear a story. If not the defendant, then who? Give some kind of story that we can rely on in order to say that there's reasonable doubt here. And you're absolutely right, Michael. There's a lot that the defense can counter. But they need to be extremely directed. They need to produce these holes in a clear and concise manner and really repeat it to the jury. But the prosecution will say, Michael, as you know, there's no perfect evidence that's left at a scene. There's always going to be something missing. And this man was a very intelligent man, Addy. He had the intelligence and the forthright, the prosecution will argue, to kind of hide his tracks, just not hide all of them. Yeah, he was a higher ranking of, um, um, uh, official at, the, uh, at the, the prison. He was older than her. I mean, you have all these negatives going for him. So it's going to be a tough hill to climb for the defense. I want to talk about the uh, charges, but when I, I don't have time. I'm being told I have to take a break. We'll get to that right after this break. So coming up next, crucial testimony from the man who discovered Molly Watson's body. The state plays the shocking 911 call that he made, and then the defense cross-examines him. Were there distractions at the crime scene? You'll want to hear that when we come back right here on Court TV, so keep it right where it is. It's just so hard to know where 
the truth ends and then fiction begins. New developments in the case of doomsday cult mom Lori Vallow and her husband Chad Daybell. Now, authorities are still searching for Vallow's children. How does she pose a threat to your children? I don't know what she's going to do with them. Think about all the people that had to die and disappear. Tell us where the kids are. Nothing is coincidental. This stretch is just so beyond what anyone could imagine. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, and I can ever come up with this. This is no longer the search for missing children. This is the search for killers. All eyes on this Idaho trial. Lori was his follower. Chad Daybell's the prophet. Chad had a vision. Plagues and foreign troops coming to the soil. It's the doomsday couple, Chad and Lori Daybell, on trial. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. This hour's testimony of the day comes from a key witness. Now, jurors heard he was from a man, he was a man who discovered the victim, Molly Watson, on a gravel road in April of 2018. And when the state called the witness to the stand, he shared the shocking phone call that he made that led authorities to the scene. So let's listen. to my mother's and I went to take the shortcut through the creek because we were both tired and we came upon uh, a pair of headlights down by the creek and then I could tell there was another car facing away from me. So the car drives towards you, at some point does it stop and the person gets out? Yeah, he, he jumped out and like come to the end of the door but I couldn't get a, with all the glare and everything I was having a hard time seeing. And that's when I yelled at him. I, I asked him, said, hey, is someone stuck down there? And he said, I don't know where they're at. It's going to be a while. And you keep saying he, this person was a man? Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us anything else about what that person looked like? Well, he appeared to look older. I couldn't get a really 100% clear look at him. And then judging by his voice also, he sounded older. Now, following that 911 call, jurors heard defense attorney T.J. Kirsch question the witness about some distractions at the crime scene that might have impacted his vision. Take a look. You said you've been down through that cut through quite a bit in the past, correct? Yeah, I, I grew up within a mile of there. 
Okay, so you know that's a popular shortcut through that area? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And you know it's a hangout, people go down there for all sorts of stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you recall initially saying that you saw what you thought was a <clears throat> truck with a camper or an SUV? Yeah, for some reason her car looked a lot bigger than what it was, I guess because of the glare. Okay, because the entire time you were looking through your windshield, right? Yeah. And the headlights coming at you were blinding, correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay. And the noise from your truck was loud, right? Yes. So you didn't get a good look and you didn't get a good hear, fair to say? Right. Okay. I, I plainly heard him say, I don't know whether it's going to be a while, but he mumbled something else too that I never heard. All right, still here with me to discuss his criminal defense attorney, Silva Megodichian. Now, Silva, uh, he was very judicious, uh, T.J. Kirsch, in his cross-examination all morning. Didn't take long with a lot of witnesses. He seemed very pointed and directed. Love to get your sense of his cross-examinations. You know, Michael, I thought he was really effective. Um, he, I, the key to really great criminal defense is not wasting the jury's time and not asking too many questions that are unnecessary that will needlessly either distract or honestly bore the jury. Um, I think that's sometimes novice criminal defense attorneys in trial. They think they have to be there for an hour asking every question under the book. And the jury loses sight of what's truly important. He did a really great job pinpointing witness identification can be wrong or it can have issues. The blinding lights. Oh, it could have been glare showing that the witness is not infallible in what he saw. And to get the witness to admit that he could have been mistaken is key. He's making right now, and you can see his formulation in his mind, he's actually formulating his closing argument by these directed questions. I actually think he did a really great job. Yeah, he had a little bit of a throwaway line there that he got the right answer to. He said, hey, a lot of people hang out there, right? And the guy said, yeah. yeah. And again, that's going to play into his closing, the idea that there could have been other people down there. Then we find out later on another cross-examination that there was a bottle and a cigarette butt that had DNA on it found near the area that was not James Addy's. So you put those two things together, and he might be creating this sort of mythical boogeyman for this jury to hang their hat on when he gives them enough evidence to say, hey, maybe somebody else did it, even though we don't know who. There's enough there to hang our hat on and say there's unreasonable doubt. Exactly, Michael. And it's something that we did not have with Prokopovich. He's actually doing a beautiful job, and you said it perfectly, this mystical boogie person that we cannot identify. Right there, you need one juror to believe that's reasonable doubt, and that's huge. And, and it's brilliant what you said. He is methodically and slowly putting the pieces together to form reasonable doubt. And if one juror comes back and says, look, there's too much evidence here. Why weren't those things DNA tested? There are a lot of people that go on this road. The prosecution's going to lose their case. Yeah. Now, I want to play a uh, soundbite from the very first witness called by the state. It was Joe Colston. He is a Mo Monroe County sheriff. And he talks a little bit about how he ultimately, once he went to the scene, he was actually off that day, heard the call come in that there was this body found, went to the scene, and then did a search for the victim. So let's take a listen how that turned out. I want to draw your attention now to um, some investigative work that you did after the Highway Patrol arrived. Um, and you began talking about an internet search. Can you describe that for the jury? Yes. So once we had identified um, Molly, um, I did an internet search to try to determine um, if I could find any information about her. Uh, during that search, I did find a uh, wedding registry um, that indicated uh, that she and uh, James Addy uh, had signed up for a uh, wedding registry at Bed Bath & Beyond. And there's also um, wedding ceremony information on a, an internet site uh, indicating that uh, Molly and, and Mr. Addy were to be married on, uh, uh, on the 29th. 
All right, so the officer, Silva, then goes to James Addy's house because he's listed on this thing. He wants to tell him. He said he initially went over there to, as an informational thing to let him know that they had found this person um, or found his fiance dead. But then he find out, surprise, surprise, the guy's married, boom, he becomes a suspect. It seems like one of the themes of the defense is that once they locked in on him as a suspect, they basically just focused all the evidence in on him. And this is a common defense because it can happen that if you focus in on one person, then suddenly everything you find beyond that, for instance, tire tracks, then focus focuses in just on that one person and perhaps letting the, somebody else who is actually guilty go free. Exactly. And that is the key defense argument. Didn't the officers have a duty to exhaust all leads, and why didn't they? Again, going back to reasonable doubt. So there is a door open, and it's incumbent on the defense to really put that together in their closing argument. Now, the, ca the, the case here is first-degree premeditated murder. And I thought that the prosecution made a mistake by not addressing the elements of that crime in their opening. They didn't talk about that and giving them a roadmap to follow along as they prove the elements of that crime. Love to get your thoughts on that. You know, Michael, I agree with you. I, I think the prosecution, they did tell a story which was effective. They did not establish a clear and concise roadmap, and that could be because they want to kind of establish it as the trial goes forward and then wrap it up with closing argument. It could be that they might have problems. You know, we saw this in the Chauvin case where the alternate juror came out and said, look, the defense attorney promised a lot in open and didn't deliver. Mm -hmm. Jurors want their attorneys to deliver what they promise. So this could be something that the prosecution did purposely and is leaving the door open and closing argument to really solidify. But you're absolutely right, Michael, that count is a huge count and you have to be extremely open, honest and point the dots to say that one plus one equals two and this is why it's first degree premeditated. That's right. All right, Silva, great, great, great uh, points you made. Stand by, because we do have a lot more to discuss. We're going to take a break right now. Now, the jury who will decide James Addy's fate saw some key evidence today that the state says proves his guilt. Investigators found tire tracks at the crime scene, and they say the tracks match Addy's vehicle. How well was this evidence presented to the jury? How important will it be in this case? We'll talk about that coming back uh, in just a moment, so stay with us right here at Code TV. Officers found something more. A perfect tire print in the damp soil, just feet from Mozzie's body. While they were still on the scene, officers went and looked at Molly's wedding website that they were able to see it still up online and found the name of her fiance, James Addy. And they set off to notify who would certainly be a devastated fiance. On the way, they found two more items. One, Molly's cell phone. And another, a bloody t-shirt thrown on the side of the road. When they got to James Addy's house in the early morning hours, Officers were met with a surprise. Melanie Addy. James Addy admitted the affair. He told officers he got himself into something he shouldn't have. And he showed them a phone that he used only to communicate with mom that his wife did not know about. Officers went out to look at the car that James Addy admitted to driving that night covered in dust. And they made special note of the tires. The right rear tire of James Addy's car was identified as the source of the tire print found just feet from Molly's body. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. Now, that was part of the state's opening statements this morning. The state wasted no time showing the jury that very important evidence in the case, 
the tire tracks. And that's our Court TV close-up. They brought in Corporal Nathan Schinkel to testify about those tracks. So let's take a listen. The grooves kind of look like if you look at the side of a tire and then there's some lettering, or it looks like lettering, or shapes that are consistent with lettering uh, from a tire. In Seats Exhibit 37, I've gotten even closer to that. You can see a little bit closer. It looked like a couple of O's. I think you can have a seat for now. Okay. So we saw the first tire print on the ground that you took a cast of. The second tire print further down on the side that you took a cast of. Was there yet another tire print that you were not, I'm sorry, that you did not take a cast of the second one? Um, was there yet another print you did not take a cast of? Yes, there was. Previously shown counsel states exhibit 38 through 40. May I approach that? Please tell me if those fairly and accurately depict the third area that you observed. Yes, they do. Your Honor, the state moves for admission and publication of states exhibits 38 through 40. Okay. Being no objection, 38 through 40 are admitted and permitted for publication. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. In States Exhibit 38, we see some water there. Um, in comparison to the earlier two areas that we had seen, where is this picture? It is east of the sink. Um, so uh, further towards the, the low water crossing? Yes. Okay. We had earlier seen a black car that was parked on the scene. Right. Is this um, back towards the main road from that car or further toward the low water crossing? Further toward the low water crossing. And obviously this is taken in daylight. Uh, why is that? Because we were at the scene for long enough for the sun to come up. I'll show you seats exhibit 39. You might pop down off the stand again to be able to point out to everyone. What is the area of interest in seats exhibit 39? You see it better there, but the tire track here in this area. What kind of soil is here? It's much more sandy appearing to me. Does sandy soil make for a good cast? Not as good as, as what we have seen. Okay. And I'll show you States Exhibit 40 there. Uh, is that a more zoomed in picture there of what? Yes. With interest of interest, but you did not cast that. That's correct. All right, still here with me to discuss is criminal defense attorney Silva Megadici. And now Silva, you know, this type of evidence, you know, the, the defense tried to keep it out. They said it was junk science and they talked about how it was done and that it was the matching was done by the eye test. There's no real standard um, to figure out if this matching was done properly. And the judge let it in. Re relatively quick hearing really didn't seem to have any issue with letting it in. Love to get your thoughts on whether that was the right thing to do. You know, Michael, honestly, as a defense attorney, I would jump up and down and say it's the wrong decision. But as a neutral party, there's no other decision the judge could have made. And the issue is the judge is telling the defense attorney, look, the jury has the right to see and analyze and decide this evidence and value it the way that they want to. So the issue becomes, it's your turn, defense attorney. If you have a problem with it, then tell the jury why and show your evidence as to why it should not be included or not be taken seriously. So I believe as a neutral party, absolutely the judge made the right decision. But again, for the defense attorney, it was key for him to keep this out. I just don't know of a judge who would have kept it out, quite honestly. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. And then, just as you said, on cross-examination, uh, he was questioned about what factors um, could be used to affect the accuracy of these type of casts and, and cast some doubt. And that's the job he was supposed to do. Let's take a look how he did. To go to the cast that you testified about, you testified that you were trained in laying these plaster casts for tire impression evidence, correct? Yes. All right. And is that part of your Division of Drug and Crime Control training? Yes. And as a part of that training, you learned how to prepare this plaster cast in the field, correct? Correct. 
and the consistency, pardon me, the consistency is important because the consistency of the plaster is how you develop a cast, correct? I believe that, yes. Yes. Is that fair to say? It is. Okay. But as part of this training, you were told no specific ratio, correct? I did, I did not remember a specific ratio. They said that you just wanted to uh, achieve the approximate consistency of pancake batter. Sure. By way of a bottle of water and a bag of plaster in your car, right? That's correct. Did they tell you thick pancake batter or thin pancake batter? No. Okay. You said that atmospheric conditions may affect the quality of the cast, correct? Yes. How so? Well, I remember discussing at the scene, you know, what, what would we do if it was 10 below zero? Uh, how would that affect it? Sure. Um, as this case would have it, uh, the, the atmospheric conditions, I mean, it was a good temperature, it wasn't extremely hot or cold, and it wasn't raining or snowing, there wasn't any precipitation. You testified that elevation also affects it. How so? I, I'm not aware of how that would affect it. All right, still with me is criminal defense attorney Silver Megadichian. And uh, Silver, the true strength of this, this evidence, now the defense can talk all they want about whether it was you know, done the right way or if it's junk science, but the true power of this particular piece of evidence is how it connects with other pieces. So when you add in the fact that someone saw someone with similar characteristics at the scene, similar car at the scene, that he parks the car in the garage, we're gonna hear testimony that that was something he doesn't normally do. We're gonna hear from his daughter that he came in, took a shower, and did laundry as well. When you start piling them on top of this piece of evidence, it becomes much stronger. Exactly. And Michael, it's it's funny because it's exactly what she said is what the jury is going to say in the jury room when they discuss this case. It, it goes back to how many more similarities or how many more crazy occurrences can happen at one time that all of these things point to just one person. And again, the jury is going to want the defense to come up with a reasonable alternative. And that's the key for the defense to win this case. If they don't do that, merely saying, oh, you know, the prosecution didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt is not enough in a case like this. Yeah, just too much circumstantial evidence pointing at the defendant. You really need that alternative theory to really come together for the jury in order, them, in order for them to come back with a not guilty verdict. All right, Sylvia, yeah. uh, Sylvia, excuse me, stand by. We have a lot coming up. Up next, would you be more likely to convict a defendant who is having a secret affair? It's not a crime, but well, maybe it is a crime. Our Court TV viewers weigh in. That's coming up next right here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. The evidence will show that yes, Jim had an affair. Jim had an affair with someone he actually loved. The evidence will show that because he had that affair, law enforcement jumped to a conclusion before knowing all of the relevant facts, law enforcement jumped to a conclusion before knowing how Molly died. Within six hours of her body being discovered, without knowing all of the, without knowing an infinite amount of potentially relevant information, Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. That was James Addy's defense attorney during his opening statement. And now it is time for our Talk Back segment. Each day we post a question on my Facebook page and on CourtTV.com, as well as our other social media platforms, Twitter and YouTube. We hear what you have to say about the latest in the trial and talk about it right here on the show. Today's question was, would you be more likely to convict a defendant who is having a secret affair? Still with me, criminal defense attorney Silver Megodichian, and joining us also is Court TV legal correspondent Julia Jene. All right, let's go to our first comment of the day. Susan Hoffman says, 
An affair for so long certainly discredits one's integrity, honesty, and credibility and tips the scales to a conviction. However, with no motive, therein lies reasonable doubt. That's interesting, Silva, because, you know, motive is not required in these cases, but you can see how important it is to folks. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an extremely intelligent and well-read viewer. But it's much simpler for jurors because, honestly, as we saw with Prokopovich as well, jurors don't like people who have illicit affairs. And his, again, the prosecution's best wording, his worlds were about to collide. And that does show at least a little bit of motive as to keeping his wife still in the dark. You know, um, Julia, I think it even goes further than just having an affair, because not only that, you have someone who is in a position of power, someone who is like a higher up as a lieutenant uh, correction officer. You have someone who is older, right? You have someone who's a, a victim who's been painted as a, just a sweet person who loved life, loved the fact that she was getting married. We heard about all the preparations. So, oh, this is a tough one. It's a real tough one. And I'm not sure I understand the viewer's comment. There's Susan saying that there's no motive because it seems that there is a motive. The state is laying out that there's the motive of him not wanting his two secret lives, his two lives rather, that were secret from each other to collide. And even though you don't need that motive to get to a criminal element of this case, it is something that the jury often wants to hear. And in this case, they are laying it out. They actually have a better motive than they do right now evidence that directly links this uh, this defendant. Yeah, that seven-year ruse was coming to an end. That sounds like motive to me. All right, let's go to our next comment. Bon Knob says, seven years and she didn't know? Something isn't right. For someone who has worked in corrections, he must have known firsthand how hard life behind bars is, but still went ahead to kill someone? You know, Silva, it's, it's true. There, there are a lot of questions in this case because clearly he cared about this person. He had gone through so much, been with her for seven years, really showed no signs of being someone capable of this. Then he goes and shoots her in the back of the head. It's, it's just some of it doesn't add up. You know, I think for all three of us, because we've, we've talked about so many cases, it doesn't make sense. I mean, just Dump her. Don't kill her. I mean, allegedly, right? But that's, I think, as humans, we just don't understand this level of violence. And they were going to get married. Like, within 48 hours, he had paid for things. She had paid for things. How does it switch off from enjoying the most beautiful day with the woman you've been with for seven years to, I got to get rid of her for my wife? Um, but, yeah, the argument is also this is a correctional officer. He knew better, for sure. Yeah, but being a correction officer, Julia, also means you have connections to folks. You and I were talking a little bit about how maybe this is a murder for hire case. Because, again, when I thought about, you know, the brutality of the crime itself, maybe it was a murder for hire case. But... You mentioned that, you know, he had gone out and done these different things. Talk about that a little bit. That he doesn't have an alibi. I would think that if he hired someone else to do it, that he would make sure that he had an ironclad alibi. In this case, he really does not. He was talking to the victim up until the point that she died on the telephone. That is confirmed by those cell phone records that the state is going to be bringing in. And he drove to a friend's house is what his uh, defense is, that that's where he was, that's what he told investigators. And that friend wasn't home. So there's no one to account for his whereabouts. And when he gets home, he tells police he was there around 8. His daughter, who was at home, says no, he was there around 10. Yeah, you know, there's so many things the defense has to deal with. We'll keep watching and we'll keep letting you know how they are dealing with it. I want to say thank you to Silva for joining us and Julia as well. Always a pleasure to have you guys on the show and always a pleasure to have you with us as well. Uh, Michael Ayala, it has really been a pleasure being with you. Up next in Closing Arguments, Vinnie Politan takes a look at the biggest moments from the first day of Missouri versus James Addy, as well as lots of other legal, new, legal news from around the nation. So keep it right here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice.